for inviting me to speak to you tonight. My derby ref name is Ted Hockeles, and I'm a referee at Texas Roller Derby. My pronouns are he, him, his. My nerd interests include anime, video games, and trivia, but one of my unique hobbies is roller derby. I started refing for Texas Roller Derby two seasons ago, and I've been head ref for four bouts so far. You may not realize this, but most of us volunteer to participate and even pay money to do it. So I think that's the definition of a nerd interest. It really is a community sport. I'm going to give a basic overview, but I really want to tell you about the things most people don't know about Derby. So I'm going to tell you about how it started and particularly how Austin is where it all began again. But first, but first, let's see some roller derby. Okay, so you think you know roller derby, but have you seen this roller derby? This is Texas roller derby, referred to by Rolling Stone as the sport's toughest league. How are we different? Elbows, allowed. Fighting, allowed. Questioning authority, allowed. We've basically got everything. The game is fast paced and the hits are brutal. You may come for the fishnets, but you're gonna leave with some newfound respect and possibly a dash of, I wonder if I can do that. But first things first, you need to get your butt to a game. Check out txrd.com for details. So what is roller derby? What did you just see? Roller derby is a full contact sport played on roller skates. It is not a fixed outcome event. Players are trying to score points by passing opposing players. And we'll discuss roller derby dates back to the 1930s and actually died around 2000. It was brought back in Austin in 2001. And from that, we now have over 1300 leagues around the world today. It can be played on both a flat surface or a bank track. I definitely do want to answer the most common question I get, and that is this. Do you have to be a woman to do roller derby? The answer is an emphatic no. Roller derby is for everyone. I play it recreationally. The sport was originally co-ed, so it just so happened a lot of women joined. So for a long time, the association of it being a women's sport exists, even though there were also men on the same teams. Roller derby is unique today in that the vast majority of participants are women and that they are the driving force. Many leagues like TXRD and WFTDA leagues, as well as the Men's Roller Derby Association, are open to trans and non-binary skaters. So what are the basic rules? In general, they will vary because of different rule sets and leagues, like any sport. You have two teams of four to five skaters on the track. On each team, one skater is designated as a jammer, denoted by the star covering on the helmet. This skater scores points by passing through the other skaters and then lapping the opposing skaters. The other skaters are blockers, play, playing both offense and defense by blocking the opposing jammer and helping their jammer. There's also a pivot who captains the blockers. Contrary to popular belief, you're not supposed to fight to do this in gameplay. So punching, tackling, tripping are legal. For example, the roller derby scene from the Harley Quinn movie, she committed a high block, high block, forearm trip, and the air skaters were not packed and failed to yield. There are many different rule sets. WFTDA for flat, for example, RDCL for bank track, and TXRD, we have our own rules. Enforcing your, these rules are your officiating team. In Derby, you'll call them zebras, enforcers, regulators, etc. In TXRD, you have a bout ref, ultimately responsible for skater safety and all officiating decisions. There are two penalty refs who watch the pack for infractions. Each jammer is assigned a point ref who counts points, determines the lead jammer, and any penalties committed by or against that skater. And here's the tricky part, calls off the jam by the legally recognized jammer. The point refs are the real heroes since they have to follow the jammer around the entire bout and we have to name off the skaters who get past. Oh gosh, it is such a relief to say everyone but the jammer. When we have them available, we'll also place line refs outside the track to watch for penalties. In the center are two scorekeepers, who are usually skaters who are not participating in the bout, who are keeping stats including score, not including the score, but who is in each lineup for every jam, who got scored against, and penalties. 
We have a timekeeper who operates two stopwatches, one keeping the official game time, but also the jam time and has to call up the jam if one minute expires. Finally, I consider the penalty mistress part of this team. When a minor penalty that doesn't affect scoring occurs, we refer that skater to the penalty wheel. There, the penalty mistress will spin the wheel with a number of face-off challenges, including two-lap duel, push cart race, long jump, tug of war, relay race, and the fan favorite pillow fight. And then we have to officiate that. Yeah, there are official rules for all of those. If the skater loses the face-off, deduct one point from the team. In this photo, starting from, my, starting from me and going clockwise, we have the officiating team of Skonic the Shredhog, Cool Hand Dan, Master Peyton, Uncle Slam, and Lacey Bones. They're all awesome people. So how did it start, and particularly, how did the revival in Austin happen? That last part's an interesting story, and varies depending on who you ask. For this, I am using the account told in the book Down in De Derby by Jennifer Barbie and Alex Cohen. NPR nerds will recognize that Alex Cohen is an NPR reporter from KPCC in Los Angeles. Yes, it is that Alex Cohen. So I'm relying on her journalistic reputation. She skated with the LA Derby dolls as Axles of Evil and even TXRD's Holy Rollers as Smothers Teresa. Thank you to Austin Public Library for getting for this for me. When I first got into roller derby a few years ago, I didn't find any books there about it. I found out about Down in Derby and suggested it and Austin Public Library got it for me. So now I'm a derby ref because of it. Thanks again. So roller skates were invented in 1863. By 1866, the first roller rink had opened in New York City. So flash forward to the 1920s, we see, our, we see endurance events like dance marathons becoming popular. In this market, a movie theater owner, Leo Seltzer, in Chicago, comes up with transcontinental roller derby. Basically, teams race to skate at the track, the equivalent of the di distance across the United States, about 2,500 miles. So that's 55,000 laps around the track. These events would last for 10 days or more around the clock, and you could pay a nickel to come in at any time and watch. He also decided to include women in the competition, and they flocked to Chicago. So men, women pairs would trade off racing on the track. There were sprint jams that were interspersed in them, and there was falling and brawling. Enter Damon Runyon, a sports writer. He pointed out to Seltzer that the actual passing was the most exciting part of the event. So he and Seltzer created a game that emphasized the passing as a sport and modern roller derby was born. This continues into the 60s and 70s with the golden age of roller derby. It was touring the country, but Seltzer also set up operations in the San Francisco Bay Area with the Bay City Bombers, Chicago Pioneers, and New York City Chiefs all playing each other, but they were all from the same area and from the same pool of skaters. A rival league called Roller Games was set up in Los Angeles. What made it different was they brought the drama with storylines and fighting akin to pro wrestling. And that stayed with the culture ever since. I want to point out this is a picture of a, uh, the Thunderbirds team. And you'll notice that not only are there men standing on the second row, but also you'll also see that they're African American players as well. Roller Derby has been very diverse. What were the rules? We don't know. Could this come back to haunt us? Yeah, maybe. Unfortunately, by 1973, those, these both got canceled on TV and it was over. But in the 80s, we got rock and roller games. This brought back the roller games teams and introduced a figure eight track with a bank wall, a jump, and an alligator pit. Yeah, live alligators in that pool right there in the front. In the 1990s, TNN introduced Roller Jam, which was really pro wrestling on skates. I watched it myself as a teenager. I'll always post a clip whenever someone wonders, can you do derby on inline skates? Look it up, it's insane. Sadly, canceled in 2001, and from there, there was no roller derby anywhere. So we get to Austin in 2001. Why roller derby in the live music capital of the world of all places? Roller derby was going to be the center of a music this festival. Go figure. There will be rock music, video screens, fire breathers, clowns stabbing each other, 
and bears lit on fire riding unicycles. I've seen the sketches. Conceived at a bar over beers and burgers, Double Dan put out flyers all around downtown Austin looking for women to meet up at the Casino El Camino on 6th Street. This is where roller derby as we know it be today began. So 50 women showed up to the meeting. They were divided into teams and Devil Dan appointed captains. The hot rod themed Hellcats, the naughty Catholic schoolgirl Holy Rollers, and the Texas themed Rhinestone Cowgirls. The group from Casino El Camino itself were dubbed Las Putas del Fuego. They were all going to become superstars, right? So just like any kind of live event, you got to get funding and get it started. So a fundraising event was scheduled. There was to be sponsorship from bars in Austin. Come the day of the event, the money for the event was not there. It just disappeared. No money means no skates and no equipment. There is a crazy tale that they were going, that the plan was to walk into a roller rink in Louisiana and walk off with just 50 pairs of roller skates. Why Louisiana? If you're gonna steal from another state, why not Oklahoma? So soon after Dan left, he would not be involved at all. It should have been over there. Nope. The women decided to move forward despite not having skates and most of them not knowing how to roller skate. By the way, never let that stop you from trying roller derby. None of us are born knowing how to roller skate. So the captains La Muerta, Hot Lips Dolly, Iron Maiden, and Sugar formed an LLC and created Bad Girls, Good Women, the BGGW. Okay, great, they formed a roller derby league. How do you play? How do you prepare? What are the rules? Remember why I said we don't know what the rules were? They didn't have them. So they attempted to reverse engineer the rules by watching old roller derby videos on ESPN and a lot was based on the episode of Charlie's Angels where Jill goes undercover in the roller derby. One of the skater's boyfriends was a hockey player, so they started doing hockey drills. They hung out at, at skating rinks in Austin, begging anyone who seemed to know how to skate well to help. A figure skating coach did come in to help. And when in doubt, WWTHD. Does anyone want to guess what that stands for? What would Tony Hawk do? That's right, the legendary pro skateboarder. I'll say roller derby is very, a very serious and strenuous sport. It takes months of very hard training to be able to do, and that's with our current knowledge. These women suffered many injuries. They had difficulty playing the game, and that'll show in the first bout. So the first bout was held June 23rd, 2002 at Skate World in Austin. It was Hellcats versus the Rhinestone Cowgirls. 350 people came to watch this flat track match. Hellcats won 45 to 38. To give you an idea, most roller derby scores today are comparable to NBA basketball. Sometimes we score hundreds of points. A second bout between the Holy Roars and Las Putas del Fuego was held at Playland two months later, and even more people showed up. So it was looking like a success. What happened to BGDW? Several things happened in 2003. La Muerta, one of the CEOs left, leaving the three CEO, leaving three CEOs in charge. Tragically, Amber Diva, our first penalty mistress, died unexpectedly. That really hit the scares hard. Roller derby's like a family. In 2003, BGDW put on a bout at South by Southwest at the Austin Convention there, and it didn't go well. The event was uninsured and the pillars were a, were a hazard. Whiskey Lamore broke her leg and the situation was not handled well by BGGW. The scares were becoming unhappy with the all powerful CEOs who are pushing to make the league into a for-profit business. Likewise, the CEOs were becoming upset at scares for not showing up for practice or paying their league dues. So a bonfire was held at, in the backyard of Cha Cha's house and most of the scares voted to leave BGGW. These skaters went on to form Texas Roller Girls as a communally owned and operated organization. And that's how all leagues that I know of to operate today, including TXRD. They continued to practice and develop flat track roller derby and eventually became a founding member of the WFTDA. 
This is very important because flat track derby is the most prevalent form of roller derby today, mostly because you can play anywhere with a flat surface. BGGW became Lone Star Roller Girls, now TXRD. They found an old Bay City bomber track in a warehouse in San Francisco and proceeded to rebuild it. The track is known as Granny. Eventually, a second track was built. TXRD has two tracks today, one that is transported and assembled for every bout, and a second one that's set up for practice at the warehouse we call the Thunderdome. By this point, leagues were forming in other cities, and today we have both flat and bank track leagues around the world. So today, we don't have just one derby league in Austin. We have several. TXRD, Texas Roller Girls, Round Rock has Rockin' City, Austin Anarchy just started as a league for men's roller derby. There's also recreational leagues around. Here's a picture of some TXRD skaters and me at a Texas Roller Girls bout. We love roller, der we love roller derby. So that's the beginning of the history of how we got here today. If you want to actually see a roller derby, you can see bouts on TXRD's YouTube channel. I really recommend the ones from the 2020 season. The video work is amazing. Also, see episodes of TXRD when it was on public access TV on the channel TXRD Historian. This year on Netflix, you can see TXRD in an episode of Home Game. They came out and filmed us for a week, including a playoff bout last year. There's the movie Whip It which is loosely based on TXRD. Some interesting facts. The movie is set in Austin, but it was filmed in Detroit. Drew Barrymore had to pay $10,000 of her own, $10, of her own, $10, of her own money to finish the track for the film. And last year, that, that track was bought by the Chicago Knockouts on eBay. The track is a design known as a kit track. If you would like to see what I just talked about, check out the documentary, Hell on Wheels. Also, check out the podcast, TXRD Fraudcast. Aaron and Josh are great nerds of the sport and give sportscaster-like analysis of the bouts. So thank you for your attention. Derby doesn't exist without our fans. Of course, due to COVID-19, TXRDs and other leagues, derby seasons are canceled. Live bouts are the primary source of income for leagues, many of which are set up as not-for-profits. League dues are not enough. TXRD has a warehouse where we keep the track with rent and utilities. So check out TXRD.com to buy merchandise or make a donation. If you're watching this and you're not from the Austin area, search for your local league and support Derby. Hopefully we'll be back soon. Got some pictures really quick. Um, so this is a pillow fight that is Queen of Hurts on the top and Death Toll is at the bottom. Um, so this is a minor penalty where somebody's fighting for a point. Right now it looks like Holy Rollers have the edge on the Cherry Bombs. There's always an after party after every derby. If you go to a roller derby, it'll usually be announced, ask around, but it's where everybody gathers. In most cases, the teams, we're all part of the same league, so we're actually all friends. Um, this is the Jackalope South Shore, and it looks like Netflix and Kill just got announced for winning some kind of award. Uh, this is a picture from the Austin Modern Art Museum. They built, they had an art, an artist had a art exhibit and part of that exhibit included this quarter pipe and the grind box and a few other skating obstacles and his wish was he wanted people to interact with the exhibit so they called us in for an afternoon to interact with the exhibit but to give you an idea of some more derby names i'm going to start from the top with me going clockwise they are scarlet harlot bitty bitty boom boom mila juka bitch nuclea princess die Shamo the Shriller Whale, Ninja Please, Bad Habitch, Dyer's Eve, and Lizard. And finally, for all you nerds here, this is the this is last year's Harry Potter tournament. It's an annual event we hold. We divide up the entire uh, league into the four houses of Hogwarts, and they play each other for the championship. In this bout, um, defending champions. Slytherin, 
took on Gryffindor. Gryffindor scored more points and therefore won the tournament. Slytherin does not recognize this result cite, and has not conceded, citing that if we count the legal points, they won. We counted the legal points and all the ghost points were going against them. So I want to say this argument has no basis because nobody can find any evidence that us referees can count. Uh, thank you, Nerd Knight, for having me. And thanks to TXRD for letting me do this. Uh, Thank you, Ted. That was great. That was super fun times. Um, so, questions. We have them. Dun, dun, dun. So, uh, how do people pick derby names? Um, I think that's one of the great things of derby. Um, and you might have heard that we do have many trans and non-binary skaters. Uh, you pick your derby name, it's an alternate identity. Um, I guess I'll tell the story of my derby name. My derby name, Ted Hockules. For those of you football nerds out there who realize, yes, it's a reference to Ed Hockley. This also means you watch way too much football. Uh, Ed Hockley is an infamous ref, for lack of a better word description, the one with the huge biceps, uh, chisel jaw, barrel, pest, barrel chest, and Burmese pythons for arms. Um, so, when I was looking for a badass ref name, I'm like, there's no badass ref more badass ref more badass than Ed Hockley. So that's that's uh that's my ref name. And I'm always thinking, how would Ed Hockley handle this? Especially with the long-winded uh, derby explanations. Um, many derby names are puns, but there is a large movement that many in the sport want to be taken seriously. So there is a trend in not in TXRD, but other leagues for people to start using their real legal names. But yeah, you just pick whatever you want. As long as it hasn't been used by somebody else, it, you can go for it. Cool. All right, we're off to a good start. Uh, we had a question from the uh, chat that was, are there any mobility impaired accessible leagues? And I'm assuming that means for, from a playing perspective. Um, so definitely, I would say um, you have to be able to skate to play. Um, there is a tiny, uh, smitey dynamite. Um, she has a spinal disorder of some kind, and she does skate. Um, and she's often a participant in rec leagues or charity mashup bouts. Um, and so she, we're always rooting for her. Uh, so, um, but uh, yeah, um, certainly it's more a matter of, um, we'll probably be able to put you in maybe a, a, a recreational league where uh, we wouldn't hit so hard, but I, I do, I would certainly admit that that is a, a shortcoming of the sport. Yeah. Okay. So um, what needs to happen for Derby to come back? Um, right now, the main thing is, I believe the city of Austin and the Palmer Event Center is forbidding um, a, events with greater than 50 people. Um, TXRD bouts can have anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people. Um, it's not uncommon for most other derbies. They're usually held at a warehouse or an industrial park, and it's not been uncommon for um, those events to actually sell out and, and come near to breaking fire hazards. Um, actually, Texas Roller Girls bouts are very popular. You can't get in usually unless you prepay your ticket. There's just no more out, out, uh, outdoor admittance. So we're mostly um, COVID-19 needs to be defeated for a roller derby to come back. Uh, we can't even hold practice because it's a full contact sport and we're basically smashing our faces into each other. <laughs> 